You cock 45. Life is good, yes. Hickok 45, your internet shooting companion, coming to you from the beautiful hills of Middle Tennessee. Tennessee, home of Jeff Quinn, Dolly Parton, Alvin York, lots of people, right? And it is, I said last week, it's the home, uh, a home of uh, these people. They might have been born somewhere else, but they lived here a long time. They're kind of famous for being Tennesseans, so we claim them, okay? <laughs> I hear all the time of people, oh, he's from Arkansas, or Johnny Cash is from Arkansas, or so-and-so was born here. Well, they left and came to Tennessee, so we're going to claim them, uh, more or less. How's that? Glad you're out here again. It's, again, a chilly day, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it could be worse. You got to look at it like that. It could be worse. could be 10 degrees colder. It could be 20 degrees colder or 30, right? Look on the bright side. You're sitting in your warm living room. You're in your apartment. You're, uh, I don't know, on the deck and in the sun in Miami watching this maybe. Or in Cancun. Or, uh, gosh, I, you, guess what? You could be anywhere, couldn't you? I didn't think of that. You could be anywhere. You could be, uh, you know, the foggy streets of London, which you are. I hear from a lot of you over there. Germany. Uh, literally anywhere. We're here from every country on the planet, I believe. And uh, people be moaning the fact that I only speak English. I'm sorry. I do well to speak that. So glad you're here, here, wherever you are. And well, yeah, wherever you are, glad you're watching from wherever you are. Because it's sort of like you're here, right? Yeah, I feel like you're here. Yeah, look it over my shoulder. And uh, glad you are. So it's a cool day. We're going to shoot a little bit, talk a little bit. As you can see, I had uh, a need, a desire to pull out a lever gun. This is another one I run across a lot as I'm digging around it. And that is my old, made in 1929, my Depression 3030, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, octagonal barrel. You've seen it before, have a video on it. Uh, maybe just one. I don't know. I haven't had this all that long. Uh, a year, maybe two. I'll have to look it up. But really, a cool uh, model 94. You know, the gun that you see in the western so much, a 92 or a 94 like this. One th uh, tip: if you're watching a western, John Wayne, especially western, or in, in, most of them, really, they're, uh, they're using the wrong firearm. If it's an older western, the wrong rifle, and uh, and. It's generally a Model 92 Winchester or a Model 94 like this one. And one tip, if you're watching, just because a lot of times you just get a glimpse and maybe they're putting a round in it or something, but you'll see the loading gate. And if it looks kind of like a, you know, kind of like this, doesn't, you can tell it's not an 1873. It doesn't have that extra side plate on it, you know. And uh, that they're, they're shooting something that was made in the 90s, some sort of anachronism, right? The longer, this is a 30-30, by the way, find around here. Uh, it's a 30-30, and it has a longer loading gate, kind of, than a, uh, generally, doesn't it? Yeah, than a Model 92. A Model 92, I'll have to get mine out. It doesn't have quite as long a loading gate, all right? And that, that's a kind of a giveaway, you know, where the screws are and everything, but uh, that's kind of a dead giveaway there, all right? But it's a nice old rifle, 30-30, thought it was 30-30 time. And I feel very uh, very lucky, fortunate to have some 30-30 ammo because uh, the stuff is, 
I know it's it's really dried up last couple of years hard to hard to find and I've had enough uh, thanks to federal to shoot uh, occasionally not a lot uh, but uh, just a great cartridge I know for a long time maybe still the case that more deer have been taken as the claim with 3030 than any other cartridge out there you know more white-tailed deer and that's you know would be because it has such a long history a long history and so many people still hunt with it you know the 3030 it's just a, a wonderful cartridge it, you know in the world of wonderful cartridges like the 308 and 30 out six all these great cartridges that will do almost anything we sometimes uh you know give short shrift to the old 3030 because it's kind of a flat nose cartridge usually and moderate distances generally and all that but you know i think we've well depending on where you're hunting uh but uh you know in this part of the country for sure the eastern part of the united states the old 3030 is about as good as anything right you're shooting out to 150 yards or something max you're shorter than that usually closer than that you know normally but uh, you know out west uh, wow there's no limit to the distance but still though as a uh, and a hunter with integrity is not going to take a shot like even if you think you might hit it you can hit it uh, you want to uh, I'm not a hunter but I know an honorable hunter shoots takes a shot that uh, he's really sure he can hit where he needs to hit to take the game humanely is what it comes down to that's what I've talked with y'all about that line in To Kill a Mockingbird where Harper Lee talks about Gatticus Finch who you know, proves his prowess with a firearm. And uh, we learned that he, uh, his nickname was a one shot Finch or something, you know, back in the day and everything. He takes out the mad dog, the rabid dog with one shot and everything with the crag carbine. You know, I, I think in the, in the novel, you don't know what the rifle is. Maybe they say it's a surplus or something. In the, in the movie, he has a crag carbine. But she makes a comment in there about how, I don't know, Jim or Scout are asking about why they didn't know he was such a good shot and why he doesn't hunt and all that, all this kind of thing. And he said, well, Maybe he just thinks, or uh, um, something to the effect that I'll look it up again now, that uh, it, he was given a gift by God and that, that uh, it wasn't fair maybe for him to hunt because he is such a good shot. That was the gist of it, that maybe it just isn't fair. Ooh, it's breezy. That, that he is such a good shot, you know, and all that kind of thing. And I would always remind students uh, at that time, take that opportunity to uh, remind them, let them know that that's not exactly, uh, you know, the correct logic, you know, and I'm not even a hunter, but that's not the correct logic on that, you know. You, you, uh, you want people who are great shots to do the hunting, if you might hunting. Even if you're anti-hunting, uh, you want people who are excellent shots to do that hunting, all right? rather than somebody who is a very average shot or a lousy shot to be taking shots at game, which you think they're gonna miss all the time because they're not, they're gonna hit them in the, somewhere in the, the ear or the, the butt or the foot or leg. They're gonna maim the animal, right? Rather than take it cleanly, quickly. With, and there, there are shots on game, in case you didn't know, uh, where it puts the animal down very, very quickly and humanely without suffering. Okay, uh, at least from our perspective. Nobody's had a conversation with the deer and asked them how much pain they were in. <laughs> but you know, see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, that's what you want. So that's what hunters do. I know, I mean, it's the ethics of hunting. You, uh, you get within distance, or you're, whether you're in a tree stand or whatever it is, to where you know you're gonna make this shot, okay? All right, yeah, sure, you could hit a, I can take shots out there at this red place with whatever I want my Glock 26 or 43 or anything. I can shoot at them three times that far away if I want, hit them occasionally and, you know, and whatever, and miss, miss a lot. And I don't even know where I'm hitting them, low or high, it doesn't matter. But if it were an animal, that's a totally different story. You want to you wanna take a shot where you know you can hit within, you know, a, a, an area, pie plate, smaller, saucer, or whatever, okay? Uh, for sure. 
not maybe, or I made a shot like this one time in my life. You know, you don't do that if you're a hunter. All right, enough on that lecture. How'd I get off on all that? Beautiful rifle, let's see if it's empty. Yep, yep, it's empty. Yeah, I mean, look at that thing. Look at those corners on the octagonal barrel, corners, those edges. Uh, the wear is, is this uh, genuine and cool. Don't look at the uh, thing on the back there. Oh man, it, I'll, I'll take that off when I finish to show you again. Remind me to take that off the back. It, the uh, Model 94 has a small, kind of a smallish stock. And none of my uh, my quick slip on my others would would fit. I need to find a I guess a smaller and extra small in those decelerators and different things I use. Uh, they just they just fall off. This thing, I don't know who makes this one. It's actually not a bad one. It's just kind of weird. Slips over and got a little bit of padding and a little bit of whatever. Um, but it fits. Only one I could find that fits. I picked it up and shouldered it and. I, I just don't enjoy it if I need it like that much on the stock. 33 doesn't kick, especially this heavy barrel thing, but I just need that distance to enjoy it. And it, it's, it's as much your eye, you know, your eye for new shooters that don't know. It's not uh, a fashion thing. Oh, this will fit me better. It'll look better as I shoulder it. You know. <laughs> How absurd would that be? It's getting your eye back getting the gun out there a little bit you know it's like making the stock longer right and so that puts your eye back a little bit further and it clarifies the sights for me that, that's one of the greatest benefits of it now if it's a really hard kicking rifle or something you get a little padding too or a shotgun but it's mainly to get my eye back a little bit okay my face back feels better so 30 30 I was in the mood. I hadn't shot it much, and uh, I really haven't shot this rifle. Probably haven't shot it a hundred times since I've owned it. Somebody has shot it, I'm sure. You know, since 1929. That's a long time. This sucker will be coming up on a hundred years before you know it in age. Amazing, amazing. Okay. And then Ballastol and Talon Grips help us uh, keep things going, so uh, we're we're pretty lucky. Uh, what else do I want to remind you of? Uh, might be a little ahead of time this week. I got maybe a little trip planned. Okay, so uh, so these are timely. The Sunday shoot arounds are pretty timely, but they're not up to the moment. You know, there could be a major events or something I wouldn't know about. There could be something earth-shattering that has happened uh, yesterday or day before, and I'm not aware of it as you see me here, as you watch me. Now it could be because I filmed it earlier. Or it could be, I'm just oblivious to stuff. I'm just so dumb, I don't know about it. I'm just hanging out in the woods, <laughs> staying away from media, right? You never know, you never know. Oh man. Uh, so yeah, this is this is cool. Now, I don't know what else I can tell you about this other than maybe take some more shots with it. Got some good old federal. Uh, 3030 Winchester, I know, I, I don't mean to tease you, entice you. Uh, a lot of people having trouble finding 3030, I realize that. Uh, I think stuff's beginning to come back around, still expensive. Uh, you know, but uh, I've had discussions with people about the 3030. I said, I really, you know, I've expressed to, to fix how I, uh, in conversations, I hate it that, you know, hunters, people that, love their 30-30 Winchester or something, and they can't even go hunting, they don't have any ammo, you know. And it was about that bad, I think, for a while. I believe you can probably find a box now, but it's gonna be expensive, really, maybe really expensive. But, you know, if it is a hunting rifle for you, you're not a competition shooter with a 30-30 <laughs> anyway. Uh, it generally is a hunting rifle cartridge. For, you know, really, I don't know if anybody goes out and planks hundreds of rounds with 30-30 like you would 5.56 five, or 308 or things like that. Uh, so my point is, if it is mainly for hunting, you know, hunters, they might, they get their guns like this one, it, the sights are on. So if I were a hunter with this gun, I, I'm not sure I'd even have to, I'd take a shot or two to make sure sights didn't get knocked off or something. Uh, but I don't need to shoot much. And even if I got three deer this year, I might, it might just take three rounds. 
or five rounds. So a box of ammo, I know with a lot of hunters, we'll talk about that. They don't even use a box of ammo in a year, maybe. You know, they don't see but two deer, they get a couple of three shots or maybe eight or nine shots and they got it sighted in. So so that's the good news, I guess. It, it doesn't take a lot of ammo generally uh, to keep a hunter going, right? So unlike us, a lot of, well, us, whoever us is, unlike we, we shooters, uh, range shooters or, or competitors where we're, you know, if we've just got 20 or 30 rounds of ammo for our favorite firearm, we basically consider ourselves out of ammo, right? <laughs> That's the old joke. I mean, I, you know, if I'm down to a couple thousand rounds for any given gun, I can't sleep at night. You know? <laughs> so, but, uh, I mean, if you're a shooter, it sometimes, it depends on what you do, it, it takes a lot of ammo, you know. If you compete, especially, and you're trying to practice some, to train some, and then, uh, you know, compete in matches, or you're going to training schools, a lot of them, I, I think they've adjusted some of their requirements and how they operate maybe during the ammo shortage. But, uh, you know, typically, I think you need to have, uh, you know, a, a pistol class, for example, you need to have uh, 800, 1,000 rounds of ammo, maybe. You know, you go to, that's what I needed to, when I went to Valor Ridge, I, I forget how many it was. It seemed like it was 800, uh, six, uh, six or 800, or I had 1,000 to make sure I'd bought. But, uh, you know, you shoot a lot of ammo. I imagine that in training. Okay, this is neat. Now, I've got two pre-64 uh, 3030s Winchesters. This one, uh, I guess, is my favorite. Got the octagonal barrel. You know I like those, right? Okay. I know. Here I am plinking with a 30-30. Who does that? <laughs> Let's shoot that uh, two-liter right there. That's why it's a good deer round. It's uh, It's got some power. It'll even blow this bowling pin away. Knock the stuffing out of it. That one down there too. Knock him right off his perch. I bet. Uh, see, I hit. Did I hit that? Let's hit that little red plate over there. All right. Hit that right red plate. Oh boy. How about the turkey again? Can't miss. Let's see. Oh, here's a paint can right here close by. It, it was not working. Let's finish it off. <laughs> got another round. How about the itty bitty ram hanging on the left? I forget about it. Oh, that one got off before I was ready. So, uh, uh Making excuses, but no, it's not an excuse. It's a reason. It's a reason why I missed it. Uh, <laughs> interesting how a, a Model 94 works. The whole the guts come down out of it. You know, that's another difference if you're watching a Western and you see him cock it. A uh, with a uh, Model 92, yeah, you, know, you got your 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 two uh, uh, what are you? Uh, bolts, you know, that come down. They're mortised in the center. They come down, but you don't have the whole bottom dropping out like that. Okay. All right. Ugh. Oh, I know. When I saw that, it reminded me I could spray that. I'd get some ballast oil on that. Yeah. Lube it up. Oh, man, that thing's... That's got some wear, but it works great and uh, looks great. That's really a wonderful rifle. Winchester, see, model 94. Nickel steel, it says right on the barrel. 30 WCF, Winchester Centerfire. Okay. Yeah, boy, trademark. Uh, and over here, it should have. Made in USA, Winchester Repeating Arms, New Haven, Connecticut. Yep. Back when Winchester was was Winchester in New Haven, Connecticut. That's another nice thing about these old guns like this. Yeah, you you go back to the time when they were real companies. You know, in, uh, now look at Connecticut. They only want gun companies up there. 
Uh, wow, so much history, so much history there. Uh, you know, what Colt and Winchester and others, it's a shame. It really is. Um, so what are we gonna talk about? I don't know, we gotta talk, can't just shoot. I, I wanna make, I wanna upset people because I talk too much, so I gotta talk about something. <laughs> One thing I was, was gonna talk about is, you know, guns like this, uh, other guns, uh, uh, you know, the variety of firearms. Most of you, if you've been into firearms very long, you have a collection uh, of uh, all sorts of different firearms probably. If you have as many as uh, 10 or 15 firearms, you might have a couple of shotguns and five or six pistols and four or five rifles or whatever. And, and, uh, and you see all the comments from people wondering, well, why you buy that or what's that for? Uh, that was late to the game, or that one there's not needed. That's just a repetition of everything that's out there, or just whatever it is. Or that gun's too big, too big to carry. Why would they make it that that heavy, and all those sorts of things? And I criticize guns for all those reasons too. If if I think they're designed for a specific purpose, and maybe they don't meet that purpose really really well. But uh, I ever wonder why the manufacturer did certain thing made it so heavy it's supposed to be a pocket gun why did it have to be that thick or you know whatever it might be but you know there the other the thing is i think a lot of shooters are are too quick to criticize uh, people for buying certain firearms or firearms for existing some firearms for you know even existing because they don't seem to i don't know they they kind of they're close to being uh, in the category maybe of a defensive pistol or something, but they're not. They, they didn't quite make it. They're too big. Yeah, it was a five or six inch barrel on a on a defensive gun or a carry gun or you know, whatever it might be like that. But I think we all need to remember that there's a lot of different categories of firearm. We've got firearms that are really for competition maybe, going and shooting in matches. You know, they tend to be bigger, don't they? And heavier, quite often, with lots of capacity. And you know, so you got competition gun, and many of them are actually built as that, sold that way, marketed that way, and it's pretty clear. Some of the big CZs and, and others, uh, uh, just wonderful guns, oh, great shooters. Wow, great shooters. Wonderful triggers, you know, really, really high capacity and, and all that beautiful sights and generally a long slide, long barrel and everything. So, so you get your competition class, you've got what else? Uh, your carry guns. And then of course you've got a different categories of that, whether it's a belt gun or it's a pocket gun. You know? And some people never carry a pocket gun. And so no matter what it is, it's a belt gun. You know, the gun I have in my pocket right now is a, guess what? A SIG P3 uh, the XL P365, and uh, you see it there in all of its beautiful splendor. Uh, the talon grips on it. It's a. It's a. It's not a range gun, really, is it? It's in. Uh, it's not even really a pocket gun, but it can be adapted to be a pocket gun for me. Uh, it could be a belt gun. It could be a home defense gun. It might be a, a gun that's just big enough for you. You like it, it fits your hand, so that's the firearm you want for home defense. You don't carry one. It never goes outside the house, maybe. It, it, it could work. So when I say defensive pistol, there's different categories, right? There's a pocket gun, there's a, a belt gun, there's a, you know, however you carry it, and then there's a, a firearm, a handgun you might have at the house for a defensive pistol. And that one could be a lot bigger, right? Could be a lot bigger than this. It could be as big as a uh, competition pistol, really, for all that matter. And that might make one of the best uh, home defense guns. A <laughs> big old, big old pistol, you know, that holds 20 rounds or something. Yeah, that 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 would be a good choice. Uh, so you got you know, got shotguns, all different categories of guns too that fit. That we can talk about your defensive shotguns. And you've got long barrel shotguns for hunting, you've got for shooting skeet and trap and all the, the various purposes. So uh, I think we need to be careful about criticizing uh, a gun firearm for existing, for not having a purpose. It probably has a purpose for somebody, right? Uh, it's just 
just what's it for? Could be just for hunting and nothing else. You know, uh, not a firearm that's well suited for, I don't know, competition, range shooting. Well, I like that. Oh, that, that old rifle. I don't you know who's going to use that in a match unless it's a classic rifle match of some sort. Just a great shooter, a range gun, a hunting gun. Uh, so there, there could be almost any firearm you see somebody buying or that they have probably has a useful purpose for them. You know, it, it, although it might not for you or me. Like I might not hunt. I might not. Uh, uh, shooting competition, you know, in rifle competition or, or whatever, uh, you know, it just depends. And most guns, though, all fit into one giant category, and I would call that the fun category, right? For shooting, just they're fun to shoot. Uh, it's fun, you know. Uh, even if it's a firearm that I don't have a specific purpose, you could give me a I know there's these skeet guns and trap shotguns that some people get into and pay many, many thousands of dollars for them. I got Kragoff, uh, Beretta, and there's other names that make uh, uh, like skeet guns for shooting clay pigeons, uh, sporting clays, uh, trap, skeet, whatever, uh, that uh, they get in multi thousands of dollars, ten, twenty thousand dollars, you know guns you know double double barrels usually i guess but those uh not always uh those are really for that purpose yeah they just are and uh and i don't really do enough of that to for that to be anything that would interest me paying huge money for a skeet gun i don't even do it hardly however if you handed me one of those right now and i did some shooting with it whether it limbs or steel targets or whatever, it'd be fun. It'd be fun to shoot. It wouldn't probably be any more fun than my Browning Satori or or any of my shotguns, but it'd be interesting. You know, interesting to shoot and just see what it feels like and figure out why it costs so much, you know. So uh, but there's a lot of a lot of firearms like that, aren't there? Uh, I think that maybe the shotgun sports, well, at least skeet shooting, clay pigeon shooting is uh it's a breed of its own in a lot of ways uh i think there are probably more people involved in that i may be wrong tell me there's maybe more people in that they're that really serious about that that uh possibly just do that they don't branch out and they don't have as much interest in like this gun or any of these guns you see that that's not as interesting to them uh, they don't they may not even have any other firearms you know but shotgunning uh, clay pigeons, that's their thing, really. And uh, they may have a $25,000 shotgun they do that with. But, you know, you may have a more expensive collection than they do. <laughs> you may have 20 different firearms. That may be the only thing they have because that's their thing. I mean, there are really, I think there are a lot of people like that. And, and uh, they just love that and live and breathe it. And uh, it doesn't seem to be as much spillover into the other shooting uh, parts of the world. Uh, so, and that's one reason a lot of shotgunners and clay pigeon shooters, I think, get dubbed as FUDs, you know, because they're not, they, some of them, not all of them, but some of them really are aghast when they see a, a black rifle, you know, an AR-15 or something, but not all of them, a lot of them probably have them. So, I don't know, I got off the trail there. I'm off the trail, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so, can I shoot this thing? I know what I wanted to do, too. Uh, I've got this, uh, I think I did, yeah. I loaded this uh, P365 with uh, some uh, regular ammo, range ammo, speaking of range and defensive stuff, because I want to shoot it. You know why, don't you? I think I mentioned it last week. Uh, I was trying to shoot this gun every week because it had that light strike and let's just see if we can hit that target right there i'll act like i'm unarmed and i'll reach for my wallet because this bad guy has told me to give him his wallet and i did i gave him my wallet <laughs> yeah all right tell you what things hard to miss with uh no light strike, so that's good. Can I load it again, just in case? I just, I just want to really feel better about this. 
uh, yeah, there we go. We got my mag loader. Uh, you know, this is a carry gun. It's not a range gun. Although I shoot it on the range, right? Let's, uh, let's, yeah, let's say that. Your carry gun should be a range gun, too. I don't care what it is and how small it is. It should be one of your, uh, I don't know about favorite range guns, but it should be a firearm you shoot at the range quite often, whenever you go, almost, okay? It just should be. Why? You know why. You want to be very confident with it, very comfortable, and you want to make sure it works, like I'm doing. <laughs> I don't want to be carrying something that might not work. There's too many reliable firearms out here these days. We're living in good times. Yeah, so, let's pull it again and shoot something. Like the cowboy and the gong. I don't know where I got to hitting there, but it's firing. It's firing. That's good. Yeah. Warms my heart. And like I said, I think last week, that was on the first shot when it had that light strike where I had to pull it out and work the slide, I guess, and then brought it up. So I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? So uh, that's cool. And you don't mind if I shoot to 30-30 some more, do you? Whoop, was there anything else I was going to talk about? Yeah, i got to talk about something. Like, uh, uh, you know, the other thing I was, I was getting to is, uh, is how we shooters are bad about obsessing about things like what's that gun for and criticizing other people's choice in what they shoot, what they carry and everything. The only thing maybe that I think is really legitimate in terms of criticizing other shooters uh, about their carry guns is if they don't shoot them, they don't ever fire them. Uh, they deserve criticism. I know it's an ammo apocalypse in a way, but you gotta shoot the thing a little bit. You know, you gotta shoot it a lot, preferably, and hopefully get some training. But uh, you know, you need to be uh, fairly, you don't have to be uh, an expert marksman, but you need to be feel very comfortable with the firearm that you have. Really comfortable with, uh, not that it feels good, but that uh, you you can hit something. You know, I don't know, different people would have different uh, you know, ideas on that, but a pie plate, if you can't pull it out wherever you have it, uh, you know, fairly uh, efficiently and pop a pie plate at uh, seven yards without any trouble every time, you know, you need to be practicing, okay? You know, a pipe plate at seven yards is nothing. You should be able to do that weak-handed, you know, really. Seven yards is really close, okay? Just, you know, just some basic level of proficiency, all right? So you'll be, you won't be a danger to society, <laughs> okay? Uh, and it, the thing is, it's fun learning, you know? It's fun learning to do it. It's like learning to shoot a basketball or something. It's just fun, so. You should be able to reach a basic level of proficiency with it. Uh, yeah, that's the thing you want to obsess about. We're bad, we, we shooters and we humans, right, about obsessing about everything. We obsess uh, about <laughs> what bullet you're, you've got in it, uh, what, uh, uh, you know, what uh, velocity the bullets are that you're shooting in your rifle or your handgun or which bullet is it an hst is it a winchester is it a federal is it whatever it is and all this sort of thing uh there's so many more important issues way more important than 100 feet per second on a bullet or 20 grains heavier or lighter or which hollow point there's so many more important uh issues when it comes to uh being ready you know, for a self-defense situation, you know, uh, you know, and the, the mental awareness, all the aspects of that. 
but uh, we, we're just bad. We're bad about obsessing about gadgetry, you know, gear, hanging all kinds of things on our gun. As soon as we get a, a new firearm, well, like this. A Glock would be a better example, I guess, or, or others, perhaps. I hear some music You're still doing the construction over there. But uh, uh, a lot of people buy a gun like this or a Glock and say, okay, now I've got the gun, I can get started. And what they mean is, now I can get see an extended uh, slide lock, uh, extended uh, some kind of, uh, change out all the sights, of course, take it apart and put a better guide rod in it and, and, and whatever parts are out there available, a different mag release maybe. It's just, I don't know, they treat it like a, a car that they got to customize or it's just not ready. You know, it's got to be personalized. And with some firearms, maybe that helps and it might even be needed for some, I don't know. Most guns these days, you buy them and they're ready to go. You, you don't really need to do much, if anything, to them. Uh, in fact, I'm afraid I'll make it more unreliable if I start changing out internal parts, especially. So I'm very, very, very wary of that myself. So anyway, I admit that. Can I shoot the, uh, the rifle a couple more times? Oh man, nice, nice, nice. Oh boy, and maybe I'll have some advice for young people before I freeze, okay? Before I freeze out here. I have to let you go. You know, so I'm doing a, a little bit better job, I think, the last couple, three weeks, or uh, not spending an hour and a half of your time, your valuable time. I've been knocking them out around an hour. Uh, you know, not that I'm trying to knock them out. I enjoy shooting, talking to you. I just don't want to ruin your whole day, take your whole day. I think I could shoot that without uh, blowing it down. Did I do that yet? <laughs> Just about did. And <laughs> uh, let's go back over there and uh, pick off that red plate. Oh, it's hard. It's hard. Well, I was shooting at the turkey on now. I think I went low. What a beautiful old rifle. And model 1894. Uh, and uh, and uh, made in this one in 1929. So, pretty cool. No tell how many people put game on the table with that rifle. Yeah, boy. All right, do I have any advice? Uh, for young people. Oh, I've got some advice. I've got some advice. I had a, uh, I saw a comment, uh, it's been a week or two ago, somebody uh, was uh, saying that, I don't know what he maybe said, yeah, life is good, but you know, when people don't treat you well or whatever, and he wasn't obnoxious about the comment or about it, anything. He was, he was saying that, I, he was, I think he was a minority uh, individual. He was saying that it was 60% of the people uh, treat him like he's, uh, I forget what phrases he used, but don't treat him well, treat him like a human or whatever. Treat him like he's less than they are. And 60% of the people he encounters, you know, and, and I, gosh, man, I answered him. Uh, you know, I think maybe, yeah, I think maybe uh, some of this is you, I mean, really. 60%? Really? I said, I don't know what circles you travel in, but, you know, 60% of the population being a bigot is a little extreme, right? I know there are people out there like that, but I think those numbers are really, really small, really small. Definitely not 60%, you know, not. I hope not even 6%, okay? Uh, but it reminded me that a lot of people, and again, talking to young people and anybody, that, you know, uh, I've said this before, I think, um, that sometimes I think it's easy to perceive that 
that we are being, I don't know, treated badly, discriminated against, uh, uh, people not being cooperative with us or whatever, in some kind of social setting or in a business or whatever we're doing. Uh, not because we are uh, a different, we are a, a different race, religion, color, whatever, nationality. Uh, 90, 99 percent, I think people, uh, people just don't care about that. My gosh, don't care. So I think we have to be careful because it's really easy. We're all a little overly sensitive, right? It's easy to be overly sensitive about things if people don't seem to be treating us right or giving us the attention we think we deserve, whatever it might be. It could be if we've walked into a business and nobody's paying attention to us. I wanted to look at this car or I wanted to do this or whatever and nobody's helping me or you know, the, the person who is helping me doesn't seem to uh, get bad vibes from them. That's something he said, some vibe, bad vibes. I get bad vibes from people all the time, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think that's something that, that people, if you are an extreme, I don't know, whatever, religion or race or whatever it might be, you're a, an extreme minority, maybe. You might not realize it. You really might. You really might not realize it. I can't identify with, with you, just like you can't identify with me. But you might not realize it, but a lot of people, here's a news flash for you, for everybody. <laughs> a, a lot of people in this world do not have very good social skills and do not treat other people the way they deserve to be treated, you know, in business or wherever they encounter them. The people working at McDonald's uh, or, or any restaurant, uh, you know, fast food restaurant especially, they may, uh, you may think they're, they're treating you like you're, like you nobody or something. They're not very helpful. They seem not to like you. You know, it's like, so if there's something about you that you dress differently than most people, you're a different color than most people, a gender, whatever it might be, it's really easy to, uh, to just uh, assign that as the problem. Okay. They're just, that's just my opinion, but I think it is in my observations in my life. Okay. I've noticed the difference in, in people's reaction to me uh, through the years based on, I don't know how old I am or uh, what I was wearing, especially what I was wearing. I've always been very, very casual. And most, many of you have noticed this too, probably, uh, how people will uh, treat you differently, you know, uh, during various periods and careers of my life, I've had to wear a suit and tie, even a three piece suit at times. and. And then as quickly as I can, I'm out of that in jeans and a t-shirt at the end of the day or whatever. And you may go to the same grocery store or you go to wherever, the same places, and people just regard you differently, treat you differently, you know, uh, just, they just do. And then so there's many different factors, uh, but, and then another news flash, people are, are just very egotistical. We all are, I guess. and we. We're all concerned with what's going on with us and our own lives. And and people can just be rude to, to people, can be and can seem uncaring and can be uncaring and disinterested in you and me. And it has nothing to do with what minority we might be a part of, a member of. Right? I mean, really, just a newsflash. It, it really, people are bad about treating other people with respect. I don't care whether you're a minority or a majority or who you are, okay? That just happens to everybody, okay? So be careful about assigning that to, to uh, some characteristic uh, uh, that you have, okay? I just thought I'd throw that out there. I've, uh, you know, 60%, eh, that's a little steep. Uh, I mean, also you got There are people who, who are paranoid, right? They think everybody's out to get them. Uh, so you you got that. Uh, people looking for, looking for that. You know that, that they don't they don't like people. They don't trust people. So they just know that everybody's out to get them. And uh, you know that that percentage could up to eighty or a hundred percent, right? So anyway, just just be careful of that. You know. Uh, don't I guess don't in, don't interpret misinterpret uh, or don't interpret just general 
rudeness or disinterest, uh, incompetence in some employee somewhere, uh, lack of social skills, you know, for for bigotry. It, it may not be. They just don't like anybody. They're not very nice to anybody. Okay. <laughs> I guess my point. And our attitude does does make a huge difference. The attitude that we give off, all right, that, that's really important. The attitude that that, that we uh, show people it make a huge difference in the world and it just determines how we move around and how how good we feel about other people based on how we act because because we our our uh, personality or our uh, body language facial expression all that can seriously uh, attract other people or can seriously repel other people and we might not even be aware of it, right? You or me, either one. We might not be aware of it, that, that we're the ones who are showing a weird attitude and it turns people off or it turns them on, you know? So, okay, just keep that in mind. It could be that, you just never know. <laughs> can I load up, can I load up this again one more time and shoot it? Cause I really enjoy shooting this. I know it seems a little uh, contradictory. Wow, look at this. I've got a, uh, do I have some more ammo? Yeah. Getting chilly out here. I'm gonna have to let y'all go before I freeze. Uh, this old classic rifle, beautiful rifle, and then this polymer pistol. Well, I guess it's not polymer, is it? The P365 is aluminum frame. <laughs> I think of it as a polymer pistol. Uh, and some people do make that as a great distinction, having a polymer uh, frame versus aluminum. I, not a lot of difference to me. They're both very lightweight, and it's not like uh, the aluminum is going to withstand another hundred years that the polymer won't. Amazed how many people who make comments about that, how that. Uh, Comparing a Glock, Glock with a 1911 or something, or any polymer pistol. Well, that 1911, you know, if I pull out a hundred-year-old 1911, you know, people will sometimes you'll see a comment about somebody uh, saying, uh, "Yeah, good old 1911 steel frame." Yeah, I wonder where those polymer pistols will be in a hundred years. Yeah, they'll probably be working just as well as that 1911. My guess. I mean, it's not a guess. I mean, yeah, you know, the, look at all the Glocks that uh, were made in the 80s. They've been going for hundreds of thousands of rounds and still going strong. So I don't know what another, uh, you know, 35 years is going to make a difference or another 100 years, really. All right. I just felt like that cowboy needed to be beat to death with lead. <laughs> yeah, I do. Oh man. Well, uh, I don't guess I had anything else brilliant to say. And uh, wait, wait a minute, I don't guess I had anything brilliant to say. I'm just glad y'all came out. I really am. And like I say, watch for our uh, merchandise at Bud's Gun Shop. A lot of you are on their mailing list. You get a, a reminder of that if you bought from them and uh, that kind of thing. And you might be on the Team Bud's, you know, uh, club and I am. And, uh, you know, so that's how you, know, you get the mail, you know, from them. But uh, anyway, they've got the hats now and the gun cases and whatever else we, we have. I'm bad, bad about reminding you all that. Uh, it's one reason we went to Bud's, let them to you know, handle that for us. We're bad about promoting that stuff. Uh, and uh, I'm not a t-shirt salesperson, but uh, we want to have that available you know, for y'all. And, uh, and so it's with them. And we don't have any t-shirts right now, but we're going we're gonna to do that too. They're going to make some of those too uh, later. Right now, just on the hats and the uh, uh, gun cases. I think it's mainly a pistol case, you know, the Cock 45 pistol case. So we may come out with a long a line of underwear and uh, socks and uh, bow ties and you know like. <laughs> so I uh, hope you enjoy this rifle. Uh, I hope you have fired a 3030 in your life. I mean they're great, great guns uh, and definitely nothing to sneeze at. 
the 3030 cartridge. And boy, this rifle is nothing to sneeze at. Although you might sneeze while you're shooting it if it's this chilly. So I'm gonna let you go. In fact, I'm gonna make you leave, okay? And uh, you know, I, wherever you are, I'm gonna make you leave. <laughs> uh, so y'all have a great week and uh, I will probably see you next Sunday. I'm gonna, maybe a little trip or two, I don't know. But uh, uh, either way, I hope to see you next Sunday morning on the Sunday shoot around. How's that? Life is good.